In times of long ago, the Ancient of Days dropped from heaven a most precious pearl. It was the secret of his kingdom and the most exquisite treasure of all. The pearl fell upon the earth among bristles and thorns. The ground blossomed around it, but only for a little while. The pearl was buried and after a while lost. Nonetheless, ever since it fell from heaven, the voice of the mystery of this pearl continues to draw the hearts and the minds of men in every generation. Even today, many are still seeking for the pearl of great price. There are those who journey around the world and never find it. Some stumble upon it by mere chance and rejoice. Few leave no stone unturned and in the end discover it. Great multitudes are still searching with dismay. The few who find it, they sell everything in order to keep it. Because every soul under heaven groans to possess it. In every human heart, there is a place that is forever empty. And this pearl alone can fill to overflow the despairing hollowness of man. And the greatest miracle of all is that all the while you are looking for the pearl, the pearl is calling upon you. The pearl has a name, and those who know its name have already found it. And that name is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And uh, Jesus came, died, was crucified, buried, and was raised. Well, he's the king of the universe. He is, to me personally, he is my everything. He is the lover of my soul. He is the king. He is my father. He is my Lord. He is my everything. So when we talk about Jesus, it's about a relationship. Who is Jesus? The Christ. The one you call God, the same is my father. Now, when I talk about Jesus, I said the one called Jesus, to him, he is the lover of my soul. He is love in motion. When you see Jesus, you see love in action. So if you've never experienced Jesus, you've never really experienced love. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So Jesus came to reveal the Father. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus taught was to reveal the Father. Jesus Christ is the one who takes away the sin of the world. Sin separates us from a holy God. And no matter what we do, all our good works, it doesn't work. There is a gap now between us and the holy God. In other words, God wanted to make a way to reconcile us to Himself. So how did God do it? He put on flesh and blood and He revealed Himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. He is an exact representation of God who never knew sin, became sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. He is sent by God, took away my sin, took away everything that separates me from the Father and reconciled me to the Father. And so in Him, I become one to the Father. The Hebrew word for knowing is yada. And the word yada means knowing Him with your heart. So many people, they know Jesus with their mind, but there are people that know Him with their heart. They don't understand all the theological statements out there, but they do know one thing, that they were blind, they were separated from God, and something happened. In simple terms, they'll tell you, He transformed my life. Jesus is my hope, my only hope. When I was an atheist, I really didn't have hope. I, I studied different religions, I studied different philosophies, but none of them seemed to me to be very plausible. I, I, I couldn't be persuaded by the promises in any of them. 
when I met Jesus Christ through a personal encounter with him, that totally changed my life. And immediately it gave me hope because before then I thought when I was an atheist, you know, if there was such a thing as an infinite being, maybe that infinite being could give us a relationship with him. Maybe that infinite being could extend to us eternal life, but there's no way we could have it on our own. And when I met Jesus Christ, I found out that yes, there is an infinite being and that God himself loved us so much that he did care about us, even about me who was going around blaspheming me and, and making fun of Christians. He cared about us so much that he made the way through the death and resurrection of Jesus that we can come to him and become his own children. When I was a child, I used to live in fear, fear of the dark, fear of uh, death, fear of so many things, just because, uh, especially in the villages when I lived in Congo, when it became dark, the sounds and the animals and so on, I used to be very afraid. The first thing that God did was to remove the fear from my heart, the fear of death, the fear of all the things, the bad things that I was doing, and I didn't know how to remove them. And so Jesus is my savior because of his sacrifice, uh, my sins are washed, my fears are gone. He's my savior, but he is also my friend. He is someone I felt comfortable being open to. I had come from a background of abuse and rejection and abandonment as a child, and I had so many issues of insecurity and fear. During that, that season, I, I, I sought the Lord to deliver me and set me free. I was gloriously set free. And as I just stayed at the altar, a few people prayed for me, and then I just stayed there. I, I began to see a vision. And I saw myself, firstly, as a little girl um, with my head on the Father's lap, and He was stroking my hair like this. And I, I'd never had a parent to do that for me uh, and to, to feel that affection. And then as I kept looking, I saw myself as a child with this really ugly face. And as I watched, this mask just peeled off my face and floated away. And then I saw myself in the heavens walking and I was clothed in these beautiful robes. And the Lord said, you, you, that's you, you're clothed in dignity. I was carrying a very heavy load of guilt and condemnation. If I bothered to pick up and read the Torah as a Jew, there were lines there that condemned me. I could see my life where I was opposed to God and His standards and His ways. And I was troubled when I saw the penalty was to be stoned to death, taken outside the camp. I carried that for years. That morning I was walking by the river, 6 a.m and I heard the sound again, a voice speaking heart to heart. And I simply said, Lord, here's my life. I've made a mess of it. I offer it to you, do whatever you would like. The amazing thing to me was, I stood up at that moment and knew that I was free. Somehow I knew I was forgiven. The heavy burden of my guilt was left there at that place by the river. He is the most wonderful, glorious Lord, Savior, friend. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And the, But the beautiful thing is he's not an entity or an idea. He's a person, the one in whose image we've been created. He's the one that's always kind. The one that every time I open my, uh, open my heart to speak to him, he's always looking at me with love. I found the person of Jesus to be one who cleanse and forgive. I found him to be the Messiah who delivers, who restores, who brings real freedom.
I have found Jesus to be deliverer, restorer, healer, the lover of my soul. He sings over you songs of deliverance. He rejoices over us with singing. So delighted as a singer to discover that this king is also a singer, but his song goes deep. I was I was walking walking back from, from school and I met two Christians, the kind of people I always made fun of. But I was I was trying to be respectful as they started talking to me and they asked me if I knew where I was going to go when I died. And they most definitely didn't. Uh, and that was actually a matter of concern to me. But, you know, I tried to go through the motions to try to appease them, but they, they were really serious about this. And so they pressed further and they explained to me that Jesus dying and rising from the dead was how I could be made right with, with God. I couldn't understand how that worked. They weren't giving me evidence per se. They were just giving me, they said, this is what the Bible said. I said, I'm an atheist and I believe in the Bible. But as I was walking home, I experienced the presence of God. And this experience was so palpable that it was just like any any person who had been in the room with me, talking with me, any any other you know human person that I could see. I'd never experienced something like that before. I got to my to my room and it was going back and forth. I I had always said, you know, well, I would want this kind of evidence or that kind of evidence. And there is there is lots of evidence. I'm a scholar now, I know there's lots of evidence. But God doesn't jump through our hoops. He didn't give me at first that evidence. He gave me instead an evidence that was even more compelling. He was right there in the room with me. And he wasn't going to let me alone until I made a decision. I always said, if I ever believed that there was a God, I would give you everything because you made me. But God, I don't understand how Jesus dying for me and rising from the dead, how that makes me right with you. But if that's what you say, I'll believe it. But I don't know how to be made right with you. So if you want to make me right with you, you're going to have to do it yourself. And all of a sudden, I felt something rushing through my body like I'd never felt before. I was so overwhelmed. I jumped up. I was like, what just happened to me? Did God just come inside of me? <laughs> First time Jesus appeared to me face to face in 1987. It was the most life-changing moment of my life. So I was very hungry for him. Because I read the Bible that says, anyone who loves me, my father and I will come and reveal ourselves to him. And I said, Jesus, I, I, I read that, I said, oh, you appear to people. So I want you to come and also appear to me. It was very simple. I had a hunger and a desire. I wanted to see him because the Bible said he appeared to other people. In fact, in Acts chapter one, it says, he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. After his passion, after he was killed, he was buried and was raised. So what was happening was that week, I had been praying and fasting and just going to class. I was a student then studying engineering. Then on the Saturday, we had a commissioning service sending us to the world. In 1987, we're graduating in engineering school. So everybody that was part of the class, you know, that was graduating, that was part of the fellowship, came and they lined us up and they preached the message and they laid hands for impartation and anointing with oil so that we can go and become ministers of the gospel. Here I was, Amazingly, as the gentleman laid hands on me, walked to the next person and then the next person, two people away from me, Jesus appeared to me just as you are in front of me. He appeared to me and the first thought that came to me was that I was dead. I was thinking, oh, I'm dead. And I began to repent of every sin I've ever committed, every mistake, what I did, what I didn't do. I was just, I felt so unclean in his presence. But there's something that I noticed. I noticed that his gaze could see everything I ever did, but pierced through me, but he was never condemning me. All I could see, just liquid love coming out of his eyes. He didn't even worry about my sins. 
And I was kind of a little perplexed because what we've been raised in the Catholic is, well, God is going to get you or you made this mistake. And we are so afraid of God. But when I met Jesus face to face, all the fears disappeared. And he just looked at me, piercing eyes of love. Somebody asked me once, how did he look like? He looked like love in a human form. And he looked straight through me. My whole being felt like I was just like a, a, a dynamite or an explosion about to happen to me. I fell down like a dead man. And I remember one night, the Holy Spirit touched me and I turned my head and I had a vision of his face. And he was looking at me with eyes of love that were just beyond my ability to cope with. And I, I saw his face looking at me like this and I, I couldn't cope with it. I, I began to laugh and cry. I, I was undone by the fact that the Son of God would look at me like that. We always get the idea that he must always be somehow not quite pleased with us, that we're not quite measuring up. But when we come to Him in faith, believing that His righteousness, His gift of mercy, when we repent, confess our sins and receive His grace, that He has made us as righteous as He is, that He doesn't look at us and see sin. He doesn't even remember our sin. He looks at us and says, you are altogether lovely. He says, you are holy, you are righteous, you're clean, and I love you. I've heard people talk about hearing God and knowing God, but I didn't think they meant it quite as literally <laughs> as, you know, like in the Bible where Moses heard the Lord and so on. But one day I was, I was praying, I was just out for a walk praying, and I felt like God wanted me to just ask Him for something and He was going to give it to me. So I asked Him for what mattered to me more than anything else. He said, God, I want to hear your voice. I, I want to know you. I want to, I want to hear your heart. I expected maybe what I was going to hear was, all right, Keener, it's about time you showed up. Uh, here are all these things you need to straighten out. Because, I mean, I guess that's the way I'd related to authority figures earlier in my life. But instead, when I heard him, he said, my child, I love you so much. I've been waiting so long for you to just let me tell you how much I love you. Look at the cross. Look at the nails in Jesus' hands. Look at the nail in his feet, the spear in his side, thorns in his brow. See the blood, my child. That's how much I love you. If you look at, look at what Jesus Christ has done, imagine it was crushed just for, for us. Jesus Christ has laid down His glory and everything about Him in heaven, just so because uh, He wants to gain us back to the Father. That simply shows the love of Christ. He was beaten, but we do not recognize Him. After He's been punished, after He's been tortured, after He's been beaten, now been nailed to the cross just because of me. That simply shows the heart. He hasn't done anything to deserve that. I deserve everything. I deserve to go to hell. I deserve to be nailed to the cross. But the amazing thing about Jesus that showed his heart to me, he laid his life down for me. Jesus Christ lost everything just because of me. But I get everything because of Jesus. God the Father loved the Son so much that he crucified him on a cross? Is that how expressions of love are done? It's not because of that. It's because he saw Nina. He saw you. He saw everyone before that cross. That, that was our place. And he said, no, I am the one who's going to carry that cross. I am the one who's going to be nailed to that cross. And I am the one who's going to save my son and my daughter. Without knowing the weight of the sin, how bad sin is, the death is the, is the consequence of sin. If you know that, then you know that you will need Jesus because it is that sin, that's the main reason why Jesus Christ came to this world, to save us, to deliver us. That is when they, re they realize how important or the importance of death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, being good can never save you. So the standard is God. 
Nobody defined good. Say, and uh, to go with that standard, that is why we need to submit to the standard of God. If our good work will save us or can save us, I mean, there's no need for Jesus Christ to, to come and die for us. So it is not of works, but it's of grace. It is a gift of God. So it is a gift, the gift of our salvation that God has given unto us. Let us just put our total trust in Jesus. You come to Him, regardless of how you are. You might say, well, I don't believe in Him. He still loves you. You might say, well, I, I want to kill the Christians. He still loves you. He just wants you to know that He will never quit in you. And He has paid a price. And sin is no longer an issue. You can come home. He is a father and who loves us more than any parent has ever loved a child. Uh, he says, can a woman forget her child or have not compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, but I will not forget you. See, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Uh, he, he became a man and took our sins so that we could have relationship with him and that he so longs with, for relationship with us. And all we have to do is humble ourselves and recognize, I need forgiveness, I need mercy, and I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He who knew no sin became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God in Christ and be joined to Him. God sent Jesus to come just for you, to pay the price and to redeem you, to restore you, to bring you hope, give you a new start so that you can live life to the fullest. Sin separated us from God, but Jesus became the bridge where we can return back to God, to purpose, to everything He designed us to be. Jesus Christ is still the same. If He was good to a person in Bible days, He will be good to you today. That if He ever forgive a sinner, He will forgive you too. Over all of these years where I have sought to not only declare who He is, but to see him demonstrate who he is. I think of a small congregation in Denver, Colorado, and in the midst of singing songs of praise and worship, all of a sudden, a young girl in her late teens crying out from the floor. It's like stereo. She made such a ruckus that the band stopped playing. I invited her, I said, what's happening? Her deaf ear had suddenly opened in the midst of the singing of the song. She was so overtaken, she cried out in thanksgiving in praise. I was in the backyard in my garden. I was thinking about life, how things have been hard. My mom, my dad have died. I was sick and so on. And I was just praying, saying, Lord, this has been a very difficult season, really. It's like it's not letting up. It's just going heavier and heavier. And as I was like weeding, it's as if I heard a voice. And Jesus said, I see you. I stopped. And then and I realized, I started to cry. I realized the word, I see you, impacted so much. God was telling me, I hear you. I understand you. I love you. I care for you. I'm going to be there for you. The Father is on a continuous journey with us to convict us of his love for us. And, and for many of us, we would find it easier if he would just tell us all the things that are wrong. But when he's trying to help us feel and experience this love that passes knowledge, that his goodness and kindness leads us to repentance. It's the thing that causes us, like the prodigal son, when the father came and wrapped his arms around him, was calling for a party and a robe and a ring, the son's response was, I'm not worthy to even be called your son. But it, the father didn't come with accusations, though he could have had so many accusations to bring. 
The Father came with undeserved grace, undeserved love. And it's that love that causes us to truly repent and, and to want to give him everything. This is the relationship that the heart of man longs for. It's the place of communion. It's the place where our souls are restored. Some people will say God exists. Some people will say God doesn't exist. Why don't you go ahead and seek him yourself? and see if God is there for sure. God sees you, God knows you. He knows your name, knows the number of the hair on your head. God loves you. And God is yearning to have a personal relationship with you. Would you let him? And see where it leads. Wouldn't it be great to be able to live forever? And, and not just to live forever, but to live into the very purpose for which you were made. But we have a problem, and that is that we human beings already ruined that purpose. We, we messed ourselves up. God cared so much about us. The, the, one, the one who designed us, the one who, who, who made us, who set everything up so that we could be here. He, he wanted to restore his purpose. He wanted to restore us to himself. So he sent his dear son, Jesus, who in a sense took the punishment that, that we deserved for the things we, we'd done wrong. He took that punishment in our place. And then God raised him from the dead and gave us the promise that if we trust in what he's done for us in Jesus, we'll have eternal life. We'll, we'll be with him forever. The disciples of Jesus said to him, what is eternal life? What, what is it? You speak about the Father. Why don't you show us who the Father is? And he said, you know, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. But you speak about this eternal life, this unending happiness, joy, peace. What is it? And he says, well, eternal life is that they may know you, the Father, and Jesus Christ, who you sent into this world. So it is a mystery that we will always be accustomed to in eternity. This is, this is why I am, I am so excited about eternity. Why? Because people say, what are you going to do in eternity? Well, Jesus said it, that they may know you, God the Father, and the Son, Jesus, who you have sent to this world. No one can ever give me what Jesus gives me. My life was darkness for 15 years of my life. It was even though my parents were Christians, I lived in fear and so on. I think that when Jesus comes into our heart, he gives us a purpose. Our lives are filled. If someone has lived their lives, you've tried your best and fight and so on, there is always an emptiness in there. Once you taste of the goodness of Jesus, then yes, you want to know it. God has a plan for every person that comes on this planet. And that doesn't mean that every person fulfills God's plan in their life. But to know Him personally is to fulfill His heart in your life. When you know Him, you understand the purpose for why we have life, the purpose for your existence, the purpose for why you're breathing. You understand you are here on a mission. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Why would Peter, James, and John, why would they leave their fishing boats? Why would they leave their vocations, their jobs, the, all of the things that they had worked so hard for and just follow Jesus? Why? Because they heard the sound of purpose. They heard the voice of eternity. Why would I leave a career that I had spent so many years and so much treasure to develop 
as an opera singer, as a traditional cantor with hopes. Because I heard the voice of purpose. Because I heard the voice of eternity. Why you are here is in Jesus. Your purpose is in Jesus. I don't care what you're doing right now. <laughs> I don't care how much you have right now. If you don't have Jesus, if you don't have the purpose. But if you have Jesus, you see, having Jesus is what determines your purpose because your purpose is in Jesus. And without you, no matter how much money you have, no matter how many people you've blessed, <laughs> without Jesus, you have no purpose. You've wasted your whole life. Because he's the one, he was, he's the one that created you. He created with a purpose. So you are in this world with a purpose. Now imagine you are not found in him. That means uh, regardless of what you're doing right now, regardless of how successful you are, you have not fulfilled the purpose of God for your life. The greatest tragedy is to become successful in what you were never designed to do. When you hear the voice of the one who has created you and endued you with giftings and callings and offers you a place at his table to go from being another person on the planet to being a friend of God, all of a sudden, all the other plans and purposes and treasure have no value whatsoever, but pleasing the heart of him who made us and placed us and calls us. This becomes the purpose of life. We got to come with our whole heart. We got to give everything to him. Let it be in control. We need to deny ourselves. We need not to allow the flesh to to be in control. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to control. Bible says, as many that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us because without the Holy Spirit, we are nothing. Your life is like a vapor. So God is giving you a trade up. He said, if you're gonna come after me, you have to first deny yourself. That means everything about you Remove it. Take up your cross. Your cross is where your old nature dies. And then you take on his new nature. I call it the easiest upgrade you can ever have. Take up your cross and follow me. And I will make you. It is how I gave you. He said, deny yourself all of the things you're craving. I am all of that and more. Whatever you're looking for, I am all of that. So you come to the place you said, no longer I living, but Christ living in me. When you come to the place where you die and he lives in you. When Jesus talks about, come to me, if you are tired and learn from me, Western world, we don't understand how do you learn from him. In countries like the Middle East, where there's a lot of agriculture, what actually happens is a big ox who walks the field every day and knows how to walk the field is tied to a smaller ox who has no idea. So the smaller ox walks alongside the big ox so that it learns how to do agriculture. So when we come to Jesus, one of the things we're meant to do is follow him. We cannot follow him and follow our flesh. We need to unfollow our flesh so that we can fully be able to follow Him. When we deny ourselves, we die to self. We die to everything we want and it's hard. And when you go through a process and God has a call on your life, He'll make sure you go through this death experience. And it's amazing. I've gone through it. I wouldn't do it any other way. Why? Because when you die to self, you become alive in Christ, you know? And the Apostle Paul said this, I lost it all. And I glorify, in actual fact, I count it all as rubbish 
for the sake of knowing Jesus my Lord and being one in him. He said that I, when Jesus hung on the cross, I died with Christ. And so when I die to self, I no longer live. And what happens is that Christ lives in me. So the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I remembered when Charles died and then Jesus took over Charles. I remember that when I died and now he took, took over my life, nothing else mattered. I lay down before Jesus and I want him to make a miracle out of my life. All I did was I yielded. I said, none of me, all of you. God always is looking for availability, not abilities. He just wants you to be a vessel and he'll pour himself into you. Make yourself a vessel. God cannot make you a vessel. He'll pay for the vessel, but the Bible says, if anyone would purge themselves, that means empty yourself, selfishness, of your own personal agendas, of trying to make it, trying to get reputation of men and all the accolades of men. God now will fill you with all of himself and you don't have to try and struggle to get there. You now become his own body. He becomes your spirit. And that is what I call being a believer. God's spirit coming to a human person and then making the human divinity. That's what I call oneness with God. And Jesus explains to his disciples how much he's worth. He says, if you value your own life in this world, you'll lose it in the next. You have to value eternal life more than any cost in this world. No matter what you might have to turn your back on, no matter what it costs us to follow Jesus. If people are upset with us, if we lose our possessions, if we lose our home for following Jesus, because some places in the world, there's active persecution for following Jesus. But what you get for following Jesus is worth more than everything else because you live forever with God for the very purpose for which you were created. When you discover how good He is, you don't want to hold on to anything. You realize that anything you hold on to is actually a limitation, something that is, is taking up the room that His love wants to fill. Sometimes the world would lie to us and tell us that, oh, you should do this for yourself. You need to have this and you need to have that. But the truth is when we forsake all, when we, when we say, Lord, you are worthy, it's not a, an act of proving our love to him. It's actually just a response that says, I trust you. And the beautiful thing is that when we trust him, he desires to give us life and life more abundant. He knows how to truly make us happy, to truly make us joyful. And, and that joy is not based on circumstances. It's based on a, a relationship that is so deeply satisfying on one who, who's able to provide all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And it's not just a, a theory, it's a reality. He, he knows how to give us a balanced, healthy, beautiful life. And if we'll trust him, fully trust him, uh, his ways are better than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And what we thought, when we thought we knew best, when we let go and, and let him lead our lives, we discover that His ways are so much more fulfilling, so much more glorious than we could have ever planned. To know Him is to know love. To know Him, to hear His voice, is to know real freedom and purpose. And I found that surrendering to the one who created me and to giving Him an opportunity to lead me and guide me is not only the path of real life, it's the path of joy and fullness and confidence to know that no matter how many breaths are left in this, these lungs, and he knows the number, that when I draw the last one to leave this place 
and to have a place with him, such confidence for this journey, to please him, to know him, to understand why I was made, why I was placed here at this time. Life abundant, I recommend it to you. There's a story in the Bible of a man who discovers a treasure in a field and he covers the treasure back up. He goes away and he sells everything he has in order to purchase that field, knowing that there is a treasure hidden there. The value goes beyond anything he has. The treasure is obviously the person of Jesus. And he is a hidden treasure that when you discover, everything else pales in comparison. And as for me, I left everything I had because of the treasure that I had discovered. I was on a route to be an opera singer. I wanted to be a cantor in a very prestigious synagogue. But when I discovered Jesus, the pearl of great price, I left all of those plans and purposes to follow him. The treasure is worth the journey. In fact, discovering this treasure is the purpose for the journey. The fishermen by the Sea of Galilee, they had a great investment in their boats and nets. It was their vocation. It's how they supplied for their family. Yet, when the pearl of great price walked by their boats and simply said the words, follow me, they heard and they saw the sound and the person of a treasure and a value that was so far above their boats and their nets and their vocations that without even a discussion, they simply left it all to follow him. What is a pearl? A pearl is a treasure. Pearls are formed in the deep ocean and they are put in crowns of kings. Pearls are so precious. That is why Jesus spoke about the merchants when they find you know, a place where the pearl, they are willing to sell everything and go and search for that pearl. Why? Because pearls are so precious. The oyster is worth absolutely nothing without the pearl. When we talk about the greatness of what God has made available to us, God has hidden this treasure in earthen vessels. Man is trying to go to space. Man is trying to do a lot of things. It's making discoveries. But man failed to make the greatest discovery, discovering what God has put in there, the very life and the very best that God has himself. God now becomes your own reward, not things. The one who created everything now comes and he is your reward. That means if you have him, everything is yours. The Almighty God hid everything that we need for life in this pearl of great price, Jesus Christ. Love, meaning, purpose in life, health, hope in abundance, and life. All of this simply flow out of Jesus Christ in us. When we have Jesus, we have the Almighty God dwelling on the inside of us. And as we go along through life, all the goodness of God flows out of Jesus Christ in us. If you have Jesus, you have everything. In Christ lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. When something lies hidden, it is not on the surface. You need to get hungry, you need to go after it, you go and need to ask for it and seek for it. We're talking about Christ. Why is he so amazing? For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a body form. I don't even think that we can comprehend that. 
because if Christ in him God lives in fullness and Christ is in me what does this make of me someone where nothing is impossible because it's no longer about me but it's about the pearl it is about the treasure that I carry we are treasures in earthen vessels so the all glory comes to God and not comes to us when Jesus was revealing the heart of the father he was speaking only in parables and so his disciples got fed up with him and he said they said to him once why don't you just speak to us plainly why does it have to be in parables he says because it's not given to everybody a parable is like a rap present a rap phrase so what you need to do is unpack the parable a lot of people say well Jesus is the pearl and that is true but you know who else is the pearl as well it's you and me because we have united with him and so God the father saw this pearl in this yard and he said you know what it is worth it that I sell everything and buy this pearl you know why because my son Jesus the greatest pearl have united with this worthless pearl that's you and me and through that union you became the greatest pearl that God the father wants to purchase sell everything so in other words god loved the world so much that he did not spare his only begotten son but sacrificed him for you and me and the whole world so this is the greatest news So what Jesus was trying to reveal to us is that pearl is going to cost you everything. But it's not just going to cost you everything. It cost the father everything. The receiving of his body and of his blood makes us one with him. There is a supernatural transformation. There's a covenant made there that makes us one with him It's the same analogy when Jesus says I am the light of the world and then in another instant he would say you are the light of the world did you say you are the light of the world and now you're pointing your finger at me and saying I am the light of the world how you are the light or I'm the light well he says no you don't understand we have complete union His desire for us is to recognize that because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made, he has made us compatible to be joined with him and that's an astonishing thought. Uh, the bride of Christ, he tells us that we're not to be unequally yoked and yet he chooses us. How could we be worthy to be a bride of the one who is perfectly holy and and this is the glorious mystery of the gospel is that his goodness and his sacrifice has made us clean has made us righteous and uh, he's it's been for a purpose so that god who is light who's perfect light and can't be have fellowship with darkness d- has made us compatible with him so that we could be joined and in that joining in that beautiful union he wants to share his secrets with us i love the picture of um you know when adam uh, was in the garden and god created male and female in his image and he put adam to sleep and then out of adam's side he brought eve but then jesus when jesus was put to death on the cross his side was pierced and out of his side out of his wounds the bride of christ has come we've been made the bride of the last adam and and this is the beauty of the new covenant so that now that we can forever uh, be one flesh with him joined with him anyone that is joined with him is one spirit so to know him means you must be a part of him you are his workmanship you are created in Christ Jesus Christ is like a marble and then you are carved out of that marble he is the marble you are the shape and when you know him you recognize his face you see his face 
you hear his voice, to know him, to know his presence, is to see his face and then to live an abundant life in him. The Bible says that it's uh, talking about the, the parable of the pearl of great price. It says, if a person looked at a field and found in the field a pearl of great price, he sold everything for the field so that he can acquire the pearl. So if you're looking at that from the scripture, Jesus is the price paid to get the pearl of great price. He is the value of the pearl. So everything was paid for that pearl, telling you that you are the pearl of great price. It talked about the field being the world the pearl being you. So God had to sell everything to get you. We're so valuable to God. I mean, uh, it cost uh, God everything just to gain us. And uh, that simply shows something because uh, Jesus Christ happened to be the only way. God has no alternative. If God has uh, an alternative or has another way, he doesn't need to bother to send Jesus Christ to us. But it's like a God himself died, laid our life down for us, uh, just so that he might gain us back to him. This is the love of God. This is how much you are valuable. Regardless of your situation, regardless of your circumstances, God values you so much. But so many times we fail to understand who we are or oh, how much God has valued us, that even though we don't value ourselves. The cruelty of that Roman cross was so deep and so horrible that even the Roman Empire outlawed the use of it in years to come. Jesus knew what was before him. He knew the weight of that which he would bear. The guilt and condemnation that kept me separated from God, I believe he looked down through the years and he saw me in my desperate place. And somehow he said, Paul Wilbur is worth the price I'm about to pay. He knew what was before him, but he also knew what was before us and the love and compassion that he has for us, his creation, his sons and daughters, his friends. He was willing and he offered himself to the cruelty of that whip that tore the flesh from his body and the shame of being hung between heaven and earth in full view, dying, gasping for every breath. And somehow he counted us worth the price. There's no greater demonstration of the love of God or of the love of Jesus that compelled him to pay a price that we could not pay. Jesus is the value of that pearl because what was paid shows the value of the pearl. For you to pay the very best is because you value the pearl beyond anything. His value was placed on us. Whatever a thing costs is what his value is. What we need to learn is God's value in us. But well, we need to change our own perspective. We need to start seeing ourselves from God's perspective, from Jesus' perspective. But if you lose that sight, you will never, you will never consider yourself valuable to God. So this is where you find your identity. You don't need to worry about anything. You don't need to care about what other people are saying about you. But you know your worth. You know your identity in Christ Jesus. And that is who you are. Because God, it costs God everything to gain you. Jesus gave everything to get us. He, he gave his entire life to get us. That's the value he has for us. And for us, he is at the pearl of great price that is worth losing everything to gain. If we, 
lose our lives, we find it in that if we, we recognize the value of the divine exchange, where we exchange our life to receive his everlasting life, he becomes the one that is inestimately uh, valuable. But, but then he feels the same way with us, that we were worth giving up heaven for and giving up his life for. And, uh, and that's the amazing part of this is that just as to us, he is the one that's worth laying our lives down for. He's the one that says that we were worth him laying his life down for us. And that's, that's what's astonishing to me. Without Jesus, life does not have any meaning. I can have all the money in the world. I can have the beautiful houses. I can have the clothes or whatever in this world. But my life will be empty if Jesus is not in my life. So I will say he's the pearl of great price because without him, there is no purpose. There is no meaning. There is just an emptiness in my life. He is the pearl of great price. Without him, there is nothing to live. Well, when I come to him, I can talk to him and know that he accepts me. And that even if my heart condemns me, he's greater than my heart, that he's better all the time than I feel like I deserve. That his love for me is beyond my ability to humanly comprehend so that I have to pray for supernatural strength to be able to comprehend this love that's higher, deeper, wider, stronger, more glorious than we could ever imagine. It's so dynamic and it's so beautiful, but I think for a lot of us, we fail to fully grasp the depth of relationship that He desires for us. He loves us so much and it's beautiful. God Almighty sent Jesus Christ from heaven down to earth for you because He loves you. Jesus Christ really loves you. He sees your struggles and He hears your cry. He knows the pain in your body, the doubts and the worries in your mind, and He knows the fears of your heart. He knows them all because He knows you and He knows you by your name. Jesus came to heal you, to save you to deliver you from all evil. He came to take away your sin and He came to take away the burdens pressing on your soul. Jesus came to satisfy your heart with love, with meaning, with purpose and truth. He came to give you hope. Don't let Him wait at the door. He stands at the door of your heart right now and knocks. Would you let Him in? Remember, Jesus Christ is your only chance. There is no other way. What every other person out there is still looking for, behold, you have just found. You have discovered the pearl of great price. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord.